I would love to hear your mystical take on exactly what the purpose was for Jesus' passion and death. Do you hold to the traditional teaching that Jesus paid the sin debt for all humanity? And you go on to ask, does one need to accept Christ to be saved and enter heaven? I'm learning there may be varying ways, uh, varying views on this, and I'm curious about yours, John. Thank you for asking. I'm going to leave the second part of that for another video about the Christ, accepting Christ, because I've talked a little bit before about Christ and Jesus, thinking them as two separate things. And this is... Uh, yeah, well, I, I, this, this becomes clear when we start to talk about what we mean by Christ and in Christ. But you're right that Jesus dying on the cross is central to the story of Christianity. And so how do we make sense of that from a non-dual perspective, as a non-dual Christian? Well, really to explain this, I am going to go back to Carl Jung, the teachings of Carl Jung. Does this help me enormously? I first discovered Carl Jung when I was a student, a university student studying theology, and we looked at the psychology of religion, and I was fascinated by Jung. And I knew that he was onto something really important in his exploration of the soul and his theory of transpersonal psychology. So if you're not familiar with Jung, I really recommend you just reading a little bit about him. I have this book here. Gosh, this book that was bought for me, The Red Book by C.J. Jung. Can you see that? It's huge. Uh, mine got a bit of water damage, unfortunately, in the old cottage we lived at was a bit damp and, and had a salt lamp near it but it's it's Jung's journals and his mandala paintings pictures I don't know if I can show you any of that um, here's one of his mandalas pick paintings and all his writings from his journals that he really poured his heart and soul into and were unpublished during his lifetime but his family released that soon so you can look at the red book he was a Christian. There's, he was famously asked, do you believe in God? To which he answered, I don't believe. I know. And I always start, you know me, I always start with experience. It's what we know in our heart, that direct knowing. And then we come to the theology and making sense of, of the story from there on. And he started with his experience and then to working with patients and... Uh, Really, he kind of mapped out the soul. And uh, he had this distinction between the conscious mind and the unconscious. That wasn't completely new. That was Freud that first introduced that. But Carl Jung developed the uh, subconscious, un the collective unconscious. That the unconscious mind or the unconscious, he just called it unconscious with a capital U, is a a field, if you want to call it a field, for want of a better word, that is shared with all of humanity. He used this word self for the unconscious or for the all that is. Someone once asked him, where does the unconscious end? You know, what is the boundary of it? To which he answered, there isn't a boundary. All right, so if we were using our language that we have been using... In our previous conversations, we just say that this is duality. All right, this is the whole of uh, dualistic understanding, because dualistic understanding is the realm of thoughts and ideas and images. You know, we have the absolute, which is above all of that, but the absolute, we can say nothing about it's formless. So uh, that that that's the source of everything. But as source is expressed in creation, it takes on form whether that's in this 3D material world that we know or in 4D as in the astral or dream realm or in other uh, dimensional realities beyond that, anything that has shape and form 
is is part of the dualistic world. So the archetypes are all part of this dualistic uh, creation, part of creation, if you want to say the created order. And self with a capital S is what Carl Jung used to describe the all that is. So I've got this as a, by means of a little kind of prop to illustrate my understanding. I've got self here, a big S, okay? So each one of us, you and I, who take our identity as a separate self, we're the small s, okay? We're the small s, with, which is consciousness that is localised and um, individual. We think it's individual and separate and localised. Am I making sense? Are you following me? But this isn't really separate to this. This is the all that is. And it's the same colour. See, I made it the same colour. At first I thought, well, you wouldn't be able to see it. But then I thought, well, that's the whole point. You can't see it. Because if I if I put the little self against the big self here, it just sort of disappears into it. Because it is. It's an indivisible whole, really. It's never separate. So even though we think we're living separate lives, and I'm called Jill and you're called John or whoever it is, whoever you, who is watching this video... We've got names and we believe that we're all separate from each other. And in this un be belief, this false belief of separation, yeah, we feel isolated, we feel lonely, we feel cut off from God. God, by the way, could be another word you use for self, with a capital S. And so we, 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 we think that we're all separate. So you've got to imagine now, I have lots of these, I can't hold them all up, but if I had, you know, seven billion of these... Uh, then uh, they would all be warring each other, fighting each other, falling out with each other, trying to compete with each other for resources and so on. You know, we 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 interact thinking that we're interacting with someone other to our self. But in actual fact, it's all self. It's all self. It's all just us. Jesus was always trying to teach us this. Love your neighbour as yourself. Love the, your neighbour, the, the, the other little self that you think is separate to you. Love them as yourself because they are yourself. This is how you keep the commandment. This is how you, you return to God because you just have to grasp this. <laughs> and, and, and it all is summed up with love, in love. Love your neighbour as yourself and love, love God, love self. Love the bigger picture, love the smaller picture and, reckon, and, 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 and see what's really happening in this little masquerade of, of, of separateness. This playing out of this game, this little story, all these separate stories unfolding at the same time, but really all being eternally linked and, and, and indivisible from the whole. And then if you grasp that, you will not war anymore you'll not fight with each other anymore everything changes your whole understanding of the whole arena and the whole play and everything the whole world is a stage and men and women are just the actors upon it you'll understand that's just kind of like a play or a dream as it's often said but it doesn't mean it's not real it doesn't mean it's not real and if you look back at the video previously i am going to link it at the end the one i made uh, previous to this one which is about compassion and I mentioned that sometimes a, a, one of the pitfalls of it can be of non-duality is thinking well because it's a dream I don't really have to engage I can disassociate I can disengage from it and you know that is uh, problematic you go into psychosis that's not how we're meant to function we're here to be here now to be fully present here now as a human being just as Jesus was. And this is why Jesus is a kind of model for the archetype of the perfect human being. And the archetype of the perfect human being is what we can call the archetype of Christ. But I will talk about that more another time. So let's just stick to Jesus. He understood this. He was an awakened soul or a Christed soul. That's why he was Jesus Christ. And as an awakened soul, he wasn't going to play the game of duality. He wasn't going to play the game of resistance. So he was going to tell the truth about what he knew about this and about his relation to this. When I and the Father are one, I am in you and you are in me and we are all in the Father. Yeah. So he understood, he got that, was trying to teach it. But 
trying to teach that got him into trouble with other little separate selves who then decided they had to kill and get rid of. So so naive, because what they were doing, if they understood what they were doing, they were killing themselves, and you couldn't possibly kill the all that is, you couldn't possibly destroy that, but they were actually damaging and destroying themselves. And this is why he says on the cross, doesn't he? Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. They don't know what they're doing, they don't understand this. Okay? So this concept of dying for everyone's sins on the cross, what are the sins? The sins are believing the illusion of separation and living your life as though that is all that is. That's where we kill each other, we deceive each other, we steal from each other, we commit adultery with someone, with your brother or your sister's wife or whatever. This is when we do all those things that harm one another out of what we think is self-interest, but it's self-interest with the small s. We're just serving the self with the small s. We're not really serving the true self. Because once we understand the true self, we we commit ourselves to an, a life of service out of love for self and others because it's one and the same thing. Love God, love others, love self. It's one and the same thing. And so to demonstrate that and to model that, Jesus refused to play the game and because he used, refused to play the game he knew that it would lead to his death his arrest and his death and he had to surrender and submit to that surrender to it not fight it because if he resisted it and if he fighted, fought it fighted, fought it he would be doing the same little game of separation that everyone else plays self-interest, self-preservation I'll lie to get out of it. I'll wriggle out of it. But I won't be true to my true self, who I really am. And Jesus had to be true to who he really was. And it meant that he suffered and he did suffer in the garden. Please, if it's possible, do I have to go through this? And yet, you know, you know the game. We know the score. He knew really he couldn't avoid it. And so he allowed himself to be arrested and he allowed himself to be crucified. And nobody could make sense of that because that was love with a capital L as they wouldn't have ever experienced it. Why would someone do that? You would only die for truth if you knew that this wasn't the end. This wasn't really something to be completely invested in long term. It was just a temporary thing. And what was real about you was this. And this is eternal and everlasting. Starts to make sense of the story. He dwelt among us. He left his place on high and chose to become one of us and live among us and to die and to be crucified and to, you know, to, on the third day he rose and so on. We know where the story comes from. The story about him overcoming the powers of darkness the archetypal powers that convince us all of the reality of this and the third dimensional world that we live in you only overcome it if you see through the veil if you see through that and you actually live for this even to the point of suffering and dying and if you want if you want to call that an atonement theory did he die for the sins of the world um, in one sense it is, because yeah, I think it's the Anselm's atonement theory, this model of love, unconditional love, that will die for love of the other. But I think, John, you're asking about dying, when you're asking about dying for the whole of humanity, I think you're talking about karmic debt, because Christians have this sense of Jesus being the saviour, in whom if we put our trust in him, all our sins are, are cleansed because of his love and his death on the cross and we're restored to God. So how do I understand that? Is that true? Yes, it's true. As a story that we can understand from this point of view. It's Jesus Christ if you like, that died for the sins of all humanity so that all of humanity can be redeemed back to God. And it's the Christ 
that is the archetype that we, you and I as our little separate selves, can choose to choose to accept. You said, do you, you have to accept Christ as your saviour. We choose to run the archetype in our lives. We choose to follow his model and not live for self. And when we say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. It is as though we take on the sins of the world as Jesus did. So he, in the atonement theory, as you know it, the traditional one, Jesus took on the sins of the world and died for the whole world. Why could he do that? Where could that story have come from? What's the truth in that story? Because as a separate self, a seemingly separate self, Jesus, the carpenter from Nazareth, knew he was the all that is and decided in that, he made a conscious choice to die. Father, forgive them, they know not what they're doing. So in a way, he can take on, as the all that is, he can take on all of it. He can take responsibility for all of it. And say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I love you. Thank you. And that's where the cleansing comes. And that's where the cleaning and the clearing of a karmic debt and the restoration to the wholeness of this all that is, comes. And some of you will be reminded of Ho'oponopono in this. Ho'oponopono is an atonement model that we can understand and use. And I love the Ho'oponopono because it demonstrates that Christ is still redeeming the world to himself in you and in me because the you and the me doesn't really exist in the in, in the real sense there is only this but if while I'm Jill I wake up to the understanding of this I can say I'm sorry please forgive me I love you thank you I can say it for my own life and I can say it for everything that comes into my awareness so that's the world as I know it turn the news on, go walk down the street. Everyone I see, everything that happens, I can say, I'm sorry, please forgive me, I love you, thank you. And it's a cleansing and a, a clearing act of redemption as the Christ archetype. I become Christ. Some Christians, if you're watching, you might be like, that's blasphemy. No, it's not. Look at your theology again. It's no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. What does that mean? It means I get it now. I see the big picture in the way Jesus saw the big picture. So I am choosing to, to run the Christ archetype in my life. I'm happy to kind of surrender this small self because I'm not really that invested in Jill. She's okay. But, you know, she messes up from time to time she can't really do that much she's not really that important in the grand scheme of things and she's only around for such a minuscule amount of time in the you know it's like a grain of sand on in on the on the beach in terms of eternity but this isn't this isn't this is really this is really big this really matters so i can make that matter by realizing that and just saying okay i'm going to sign up i'm signing up for that cause I'm living for that now. It's no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. And I must become less, less attached to the Jill story, that he becomes more. He, doesn't matter what pronoun we use, Christ becomes more. Because it's the Christ that redeems the world to himself. And he's still in the process of redeeming the world to himself, herself, to the all that is. So we are the hands and feet of Christ. We are the, you know, the, the eyes of Christ. We, in the way that we live, in the way that we speak to others, 
the way that we speak our truth, just the way we think, because your very thoughts, you might never leave your house today, but your thoughts are creating your reality and the reality of all the other little separate selves in the world because you're downloading and you're uploading to this all the time by your thoughts, by how you choose to use them. So choose Christ. Choose love. Is it important that we accept Christ? Yes. And you know, if you're somebody that doesn't understand or isn't interested in non-duality, then yeah, just do it the way that you want to do, in the dualistic way that the Christians have always done it, uh, because it's not wrong, it's not untrue. It's just that sometimes in the telling of it, gets kind of lost in translation a little bit, especially when they start saying it's only through Christ. That means only the Christians. I saw a video today, funnily enough, it came up on my, on my feed. It was the Pope. <laughs> the Pope, and he was at this sort of interfaith place, um, kind of convention or something, and he was talking and he was, <laughs> he was pretty much, pretty much saying what I've just said in a different way. He was saying that God... There's only one God. There aren't lots of different gods. So you just use a different language. You, in your faith, use a different language to what I use in my faith. But there's only one God. God can't be divided. So we shouldn't be fighting over God or pulling at him like he's a rag doll. I've got him, really. No, I've got him. We've got him. No, that's what the, that's what the separatist Christians, the fundamentalists of any um, religion, actually, want to do. Because they want to take it literally and they want to believe that they've got the truth. And Jesus weeps. God weeps. And the Pope was saying this. We just use different languages. In other words, universalism. But this story about Jesus dying for the sins of the whole world can be a really helpful one if we understand that we're talking about the Christ the Christ model the only when we come to realize who we truly are who that small self truly is will we get it right will we just change the way we think about self and others and all the sins of the world are redeemed they're cleansed because we will then say I'm sorry Please forgive me. I love you. Thank you. Thank you for bringing me home to this awareness. Thank you for bringing me peace, joy, hope and salvation. So I hope that helps. Let me know your thoughts in the comments as always. And thanks for watching. I'll see you again next time.